is Nan McKay, and I would like to introduce you today to Ruth White. Ruth is one of the nation's leading experts on the nexus between housing policy and child welfare. She's co-founder and executive director of the National Center for Housing and Child Welfare, and she's a former director of housing and homelessness for the Child Welfare League of America. So welcome, Ruth White. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Now, Ruth, let's go back just a little bit. And let me ask, because you're into an area of advocacy and championing people, how did your early life affect who you are today? What an interesting question. So you might be shocked to know that I'm the youngest of 10 children. <laughs> uh, so, you know, in, growing up in my family, you had to learn to accommodate other people's personalities and their preferences. And certainly being the youngest, um, nobody was going to accommodate my needs. So um, there, there's that, the ability to kind of adjust to different situations and other people's personalities. But um, it was also a bit chaotic. And so I, I'm not uncomfortable with chaos, but I'm always looking for a way to find some, make some sense of it. So that, that had a big impact on me. I'm wondering whether you had to fight for your food at the dinner table. <laughs> That's yeah. I got my master's. Yes. <laughs> my, when I got my master's degree, my brother Danny, God rest his soul, called me to congratulate me. And he said, not only am I surprised you graduated um, with a master's degree, but I'm not sure how you survived because there was never any food for you and nobody knew where you were half the time. <laughs> You probably like that other part. Nobody knew where you were half the time. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I'm sure along the way you've had to encounter hurdles, maybe some discrimination from time to time. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got started in your career and what things did you have to overcome? Well, that's interesting. I think because I have a personality that uh, I, I, I accommodate other people's um, uh, quirks or um, preferences, I've been able to sort of navigate that and um, poker face my way through various um, circumstances. Uh, but it's interesting, I would think all women starting out experience um, um, underappreciation and, and uh, uh, the assumption that they're not going to be able to produce. Um, so I, I didn't experience that any more than any other woman, but I, I did come into the field when I was dealing with sort of the old boys network and, and, and housing and, and, and social services. Um, but I navigated that by making, you know, just assuming that everybody has, they wake up in the morning and they want to do well. Okay, so they might not say the right thing to me. They might not treat me with the respect that I feel I'm entitled to. But if I assume that their intentions were good, I was able to learn from them and uh, over time, help them change. And I, I do want to say that some of the gentlemen that I worked with are now in their 90s. And so you can imagine, I'm in my early 20s when I come into the field, they're well into their 60s and 70s. So they had a way of treating women that I might not have found palatable, but they did give me opportunities. And so I sort of um, took the good with the bad and learned what I could. And now I've assumed some of their leadership roles. And um, I'm very, very close to those to those uh, men, and we, we navigated that new world together, and so I, I tried to assume they had the best of intentions. Um, and sometimes, uh, if you go in with that attitude, they are almost glad to help you get from one place to another because you're the new kid on the block and the younger one. Yeah, and I, I, I really felt that to be the case, and that I was, I was fortunate in that indeed they did have my best interests and, and my professional growth in, in mind. Mm -hmm. So how have you blazed trails for other women? Well, uh, I think that I do that by working directly with uh, young women and, and truly listening to what it is that they're, um, they're seeing and they're, um, they're observing. And, and uh, I, I try to expose them to new and interesting ideas. So I, I noticed when I was coming up that I saw things that didn't make sense. And so I simply kept a diary 
I tried to learn everything that I could. And as I learned more information, I was able to improve sort of the flaws in the system that I saw. So what I try to encourage young women to do is be observant, be curious, but also before you enter the fray with new ideas, make sure that you've done your research, right? Because sometimes you think something doesn't work well, but that's actually the best approximation that the system can, can produce. Um, so I, I just, I, I, I encourage young women to be curious. Um, the other thing is I took on a lot of responsibility that was outside of my um, uh, job description. So if I had a boss that said, would you come and take notes for this meeting? Would you make copies? Would you pinch hit at this meeting for me? And I was always willing to do those things. And it was a little bit burdensome, but I felt like that it was important that I had these opportunities. And so I learned, I learned a lot and I met a lot of very powerful people doing that. And um, I encourage young folks to do that as well. Because eventually it may give you more access to more people. It will. And they see that you're earnest and that you're a hard worker. So when I was at the Child Welfare League of America, for example, to the, a vice president and a program director asked me if I would take notes at these meetings for the leadership team. And it was, it was extremely burdensome because I had young children and these meetings wouldn't wrap up until like 6 p.m., um, but I did do it, and I ended up becoming very close with these two women. Uh, and so at the time, I was a program coordinator, program manager. When a leadership position came up to direct a department, they recommended me for that job, and I did, in fact, get it. Interesting. And, you know, that's kind of a decision, and it kind of ties into another thought I have. It seems like in, in life every major decision that you make can take you kind of one direction or another. And that may have been an example of one decision that you made to continue to do what needed to be done that then took you into a direction of becoming friends with the other women and being able to continue on and meet other people. What other, what other uh, decisions have you had in your life like that? Well, it's interesting. I was given a, um, an option when I was at the Child Welfare League. The, the league was going through a bit of a staff contraction at the time. And they offered uh, for me to be able to stay that I would have to become, to not only do my own job, but become a program manager within the adoption department. And adoption is not within my bailiwick. I, I don't know much about it at the time. I certainly didn't know anything about it. Um, and I, I agreed to take on that job. I didn't necessarily learn anything in that job that would have advanced the ball for affordable housing or um, homeless services or, or those kinds of things. But I learned so much about adoption. So it, no, it didn't move the needle for me uh, personally, I mean professionally. But personally, I grew as a person learning about what is going on with international adoption, infant adoption, safe places for infants um, at, you know, fire stations. So I feel like that just to have that curiosity as a person and as a human, even when you make a career decision like that, and it doesn't say pay off, like I didn't get a promotion because of that, it makes you a better, more broad thinking person. Absolutely, it does. You've worked to reduce or maybe even alleviate homelessness for most of your life. What fueled your passion for this area? Well, I think that goes back to my childhood as well. So I grew up, um, I'm from Cleveland. You can see my Cleveland Browns helmet on my shelf behind me. Um, I still cling very closely to my Cleveland roots, but I grew up in a place called Shaker Heights and Shaker Heights um, was the neighboring community, Shaker Heights uh, was the Buckeye community, um, Buckeye Kinsman area. The infant mortality rate for that area of the country um, was about uh, as high as some third world nations. There's a lot of poverty in that area. And Shaker Heights is considered very wealthy, um, well-known uh, suburbs, known nationally. To, to be able to go across a city line and see that juxtaposition had a real impact on me. I, I really got interested in housing and community development policy. And it, it is also the case that many, much of that 
um, property has been revitalized through um, some major programs run by the Housing and Urban Development Department. And I, I saw that as a college student and I thought, I really want to be a part of that. I think housing, there's a solution to the housing problems of Americans and I, I want to be a part of that. You know, I think people have a perception of homelessness. They have a perception of people who are homeless. I think a lot of people feel there's a strong uh, mental problem with a lot of people who are homeless and disability. And yet more than, it's more than that. So tell us more about homelessness. Tell us the reality of people who are homeless and what homelessness is. Well, for me, what I think has been so fascinating and, um, and somewhat tragic in my life is every time you meet someone who's experienced homelessness, their story is completely different than the last person that you met. So there are, like in all of our lives, a multiplicity of things that we've experienced. And then here we are in this current circumstance. Um, so the stories are fascinating that, that folks have who are homeless. Um, and the, the fact that everyone's story is different means that on a community level, we have to have a system that is equally flexible. Uh, and so I try to honor the stories that, that folks who have experienced homelessness have given me. I consider those stories a gift. I mean, people are on, they're revealing to you the most intimate, tragic circumstances of their lives. And if people are willing to tell me those stories, I have to go to Congress and ask, ask for an equally robust package and a solution. And so it, it has to be as equally flexible to the stories that I hear. So tell me what robust and flexible mean to you in this area. Well, it, uh, unfortunately, our system doesn't work like that right now. But um, where, uh, where I started out my career in Columbus, um, it was uh, 1995, so the early 90s, um, mid 90s. And at that time, there was a flexible, bi-directional, seamless continuum of care for folks that are homeless. And it didn't exactly matter how you ended up homeless or where on that continuum you entered the fray, you could be served and moved along quickly to, to housing. So, um, and in fact, it was called the continuum of care. Uh, and in the year 2000, it won the Harvard Kennedy School of Government's Innovation and Government Award. That, that's how uh, brilliant this policy was. So um, if you were a domestic violence victim, you could come in very quickly, get into a, unit, a shelter unit, move through transitional housing and into permanent housing with the Section 8 voucher. So um, to me, that's a robust system that I could enter at any point. It's also the case that if there are ser folks with serious mental illness who have been through jails or they've been um, released from uh, residential treatment facilities or living on the street continuously, those folks also, there was street outreach to find them and help them move into a kind of a three hots and a cot shelter. And then once they were stabilized, again, move them into permanent housing. That system has essentially been dispensed with and we now have a system that looks very, very different. My feeling is, perhaps I'm biased because I started my career when we had a very robust bi-directional continuum of seamless continuum of care. Um, I'm biased, I think that needs to be rebuilt and I think local control needs to be restored. It's interesting. I had podcasted a woman, her name is Betty Lou Larson, who worked for, and still does, works for Catholic Charities, but she, her job is to go to the legislature each year and try to get some funding for homelessness. And one of the things that she talked about was a program, I think it was called Housing First. Does that ring a bell with you? Mm -hmm. Housing First. And she just thought that was so helpful because it addressed the whole person, but it's also very expensive. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Sure. Well, Housing First, um, the way that it's conceived on the federal level is more of a um, concept, not so much a program. So the mm -hmm. idea is that regardless of what your challenges are, you should be moved 
from that circle from home homelessness into housing as quickly as possible and that within that housing then your problems could be dealt with so if you needed mental health treatment or um, uh, services of some sort and regardless of whether or not you participated in those services you would never be evicted from your housing so that's a, that's housing first um, I advocate for that program and in fact in the 90s that that concept has been around since the early 90s and 96 is when it kind of took off. I'm all for that. Um, part of the problem, however, with the, the way the funding is designed is there, there isn't enough funding to do emergency services and housing first. So where we used to have a bi-directional seamless continuum of options where you could come in at all different points regardless of whether you need a homeless prevention or, or a permanent supportive housing unit, the coordinated entry system can only process you for permanent supportive housing at this point. So you can't, domestic violence shelters have been shut down, family shelters have been shut down. And in fact, men's and women's shelters for individuals have been shut down, which is why you see the growing street homelessness phenomenon. Uh, 10 cities have actually grown 3,000% in a decade. And it's because there isn't a way to get you into a shelter placement quickly and move you along the continuum from there. We'd like to see that rebuilt. That can coexist with Housing First. And, and our uh, uh, feeling is that is Housing First. It's the right kind of Housing First. Do you know Rick Gentry of San Diego Housing oh, First? Oh, yes, I do. Yeah, is he the um, HUD regional director? He, no. He, 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 He's the executive director of the Housing Authority. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you listen to his podcast on community trailblazers, mm -hmm. he has done some really innovative things in the homeless area and is very, very much a champion of that area that I think you would really enjoy discussing some things with him because he feels passionately about it too. And has made some huge strides in their city. Mm -hmm. To alleviate homelessness. Well, he also has in place some really intriguing um, public-private partnerships. Uh, so even when we have the housing authorities that are stepping up with vouchers, it, you, you don't magically have landlords willing to rent to folks who have serious mental illness. Mm -hmm. So the Rick Gentry's of the world, those public housing directors have gone out with private developers and done some magical things to, to create the bricks and mortar necessary to get people stabilized and, and uh, create homes for them. Well, we must do something because, you know, our homelessness is going, population is going to grow, especially with some of the problems we're experiencing right now. And we, we need to have a, a good plan in place or at least some money. <laughs> that, mm -hmm. That's what he was saying. There's just not enough money to go around on it. Mm -hmm. Now, you also seem to have a passion for protecting children. So what progress has been made in that area? Well, we're, I think we're at a fulcrum moment for child welfare at this point in the country. Um, you know, for many, many years, there were, was this tension between children's rights and parents' rights. And then we would spend a lot of time talking about youth aging out of foster care. And we would then sort of abandon the, you know, conversation about families. It appears that with our current Children's Bureau director, Jerry Milner, um, we're able to walk and chew gum at the same time. So we're talking about keeping, whenever possible, keeping families preserved, providing services and housing for them so they can live together um, whenever possible. But we're also having a really important conversation about for the young people that are unable to reunify, uh, where can we find adoptive placements for them? Where, how can we find permanency for them? And then in the event that that permanency doesn't happen, we have to ensure that every young person who ages out of foster care has a solid economic base for self-sufficiency and adulthood. So it appears that we're now at a point in American history where we can discuss that entire menu. And I, I, feel really, I feel really good about that. Talk a little bit about the foster care system. Positives, it's negatives, what they could do better, what they do well. Well, and herein lies the fulcrum moment. Um, there's widespread acknowledgement that the system is broken. Um, too many children are taken There's from their parents. There's a um, over-representation of minority children in the system that is quite stark. Um, and 
children are moved too frequently. So once they're brought into foster care, I'm, I work with young people, you know, young adults who are actively trying to change the system. They were in 16 and 17 different foster homes in the, in the years that they were in the system. Mm -hmm. And that's just simply unacceptable. So we're, we feel now that the best way to move forward is reduce the amount of children who enter foster care unnecessarily as a consequence of their parents' poverty. So we need to do a better job preserving families. But then for the children that enter the system, they simply must have an optimal level of care. They, they need to be in a, 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 the foster parents need to be fully supported by the state um, with whatever they need to keep children healthy and happy. I mean, it's interesting, the amount of um, uh, fundraising that is done to buy new shoes for foster children. And I, I'm all for those efforts, but my goodness, if the state has intervened and removed a child from their family, surely the state can provide new shoes and a volleyball uniform and a coat and a prom dress. I mean, so if we're taking less children into care only when it's absolutely necessary, there's the foster care system has to operate seamlessly. I think to get them. You have made great strides in getting funding for the family unification program. And people in our housing industry know what that is, but a lot of other people don't on our listeners. Would you just explain that to people a little bit? Well, sure. And it's such an important example of how important public housing authorities are. Um, so the Family Unification Program is a 30-year-old program. Uh, in the late 80s, there was a spike in family homelessness. And because we don't in this country have an entitlement to housing, uh, but foster care essentially does operate like an entitlement. When a child is removed from their family, um, that, that foster care payment is paid for out of the Social Security Act. So it is essentially an entitlement. So what happened in the late 80s uh, was homeless families were increasingly losing their children to foster care simply because they were homeless. So there were a number of class action suits across the country, Illinois, New York, Washington State, and on goes the list. So the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, HHS, the Child Welfare League of America, Children's Defense Fund, they came together and they said there must be a better way um, to move forward. And so they created this concept called the Family Unification Program. And it provides a Section 8 voucher to a family for whom housing is the reason that the children are at risk of re being removed or uh, it housing is the reason a child cannot be returned home. Um, and there's about 50,000 of these vouchers nationwide. Now you've also championed demand vouchers for foster youth. Talk, talk about that a little bit. That's an amazing story. So I have operated um, at the federal level as an advocate for the Family Unification Program for about 20 years. But about six years ago, it's so a group of young people that came to town. Um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rewind that question. <laughs> so I forgot an important part about the Family Unification Program. Okay, so the Family Unification Program is a 30 year old program. In the year 2000, a group of young people came to myself and my coworker and informed us that young people aging out of foster care needed vouchers too because they were overwhelmingly aging out into homelessness. And I had to admit at that time, I had no idea that young people were reaching the age of majority and being sent off to the world and half of them were ending up in homeless shelters. I didn't know. So we, they asked us if we would go to Congress and ask for youth to be added as an eligible population. We thought that was a brilliant idea and it came directly from youth. And so in the year 2000, Congress moved swiftly to add youth as an eligible population. But more recently, I have been working with a group of young people, largely from my home state, Ohio, who've uh, registered some complaints about the Family Unification Program. So like many housing resources, uh, they're not provided everywhere in the country, and they're not necessarily available at the time when a household would need them. So these young people argued that Family Unification Program vouchers for youth should be available regardless of where a young person is aging out and perfectly timed with their emancipation. And for a couple of years, I thought there's no way that could possibly happen. 
But two years ago, working with the youth, we figured out that HUD does have a very nimble, very flexible pot of money, and that pot of money had a carryover of around $133 million. And that pot of money is called the Tenant Protection Account. Family Unification Program is an eligible use of the Tenant Protection Account. So working with the youth, we created a concept paper and we requested a meeting with Secretary Carson and we were granted that meeting upon our first request. That meeting happened in March of 2019 and we offered the proposal and the pro proposal simply looked like this. Take the Family Unification Program, universalize it, and allow housing authorities to request vouchers on demand whenever they get a referral for a youth aging out. So it was perfectly synchronized with emancipation. And the concept paper was pretty airtight. The Public Housing Authority Directors Association helped us um, shape it up. And um, I have a bit of an expertise on the tenant protection account. So we pulled it together. And would you believe Secretary Carson said, this is within my jurisdiction, it's within my authority, it doesn't require congressional action, and we have the money on hand, I don't see any reason to wait. And so by July 26th, HUD had the NOFA written, the notice written and issued, and they invited housing authorities on that very day, July 26th, 2019, to apply. And over that time, about 800 youth have already received their vouchers, and they are issued on demand. And I'll just say one more thing about it, it's so fascinating. It can be issued in increments as small as one voucher. And that's very important because there are entire swaths of the country where you really only have one kid aging out in a year. That's it. Uh, they don't take a lot of kids. They don't have a big system. And so, for example, Stillwater, Oklahoma, they requested one voucher for one young person by name, and that voucher was issued on demand. And that's happened all over the country. That is fantastic. <laughs> So what would you say to a young person today who has a passion like you have for wanting to do good? What would you say to them? Well, I would say, um, I would give them recommendations from two prominent Americans. One is Barack Obama. So the other night, Barack Obama did that beautiful commencement speech offered to all graduates nationwide. And he said, your ideas are probably just as good as anybody else who's trying to figure this out in the country. So I've told that to my students for years. Um, your idea is probably just as good as anybody who's in leadership today. So go out there and, and try and make a difference in the world. But the other person I would offer them advice from is Dr. Ben Carson himself who runs HUD. So he's been saying for decades to youth across the country, read. Use your public libraries. Read everything you can get your hands on because if you really want to make an impact in the world, you have to have information. And, and the information is out there. And so that's what I, I think is, is important is you have to be curious, but do go out there and learn what your elders have already put on paper for you. And, um, uh, and I, I will just say that, that um, the concept that is FYI, was forced into place because youth identified a, a very serious concern and there's a lack of synchronization between federal programs, but we wouldn't have been able to create the concept paper if we hadn't done the research and folks like you, um, uh, you know, folks of the Public Housing Authority Directors Association, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, they do make their materials available. And so we simply read all of that, knitted it together and offered it to HUD. So I, I just say, be curious and read as much as you can, and folks are out there to help you. Well, thank you so much for your passion and being such an inspiration to people. I think that you have accomplished so much. Is there anything else you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, I just wanna thank you for taking the time to profile all of um, uh, these trailblazers, all of these women, because again, more, the more we hear about how folks have navigated all of these barriers and found a way to surmount them, the better we can prepare ourselves to move forward in the future and, and, and do great things. So thank you so much for this forum, ma'am. It's kind of another way of saying we're all in this together. Amen. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.